welcome to uh, committee members and guests to our mm -hmm. community and patients uh, committee meeting. Now, just as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded for minuting purpose, but also the recording is uploaded to the website so people can make a reference to the meeting if they couldn't attend today. They can uh, watch it at a later stage. Um, also a reminder is that the meeting is held in public. So it's not a public meeting, but it's held in public. Of course, questions are welcome. Uh, if a question is asked, we don't have the answer, we'll endeavor to go back with the answer. Um, please use the chat if the question you may have may not completely be relevant to an agenda item, but please record those messages in the chat and again we'll endeavor to go back with answers. Um, committee members, we're not going to introduce uh, everyone, so please, please, when you speak, um, just introduce yourself and say that you're a committee member so people know uh, that you are. And any speakers, presenters, and any guests, again, before you speak, if you don't mind just uh, introducing yourself, say who you are and where from. Again, so we know who we're talking about. Uh, presenters, if you don't mind, when it comes to sharing your presentation, please drive it. But uh, please, please remember that we all, those who received the papers for the meeting, have read the paperwork. So please do not go page by page through uh, the, the information sent, but pick up on key issues, uh, highlight them, and then that will provide us with the opportunity to ask questions. So please do not replicate what's in the papers already, but just identify the key key messages. Uh, I think I've covered, yeah, and the use of um, electronic hand, please, uh, can we make use of that so we can have some order, otherwise we'll all be talking over each other. And if you're not talking, if you don't mind muting yourself, it will be great. Okay, I think I'm done with that. So uh, welcome again, and we're just going to um, get on with our agenda. There are slight changes to the one that you circulated, so bear with me. Uh, I will follow my agenda, <laughs> which has been updated literally within the last 20 minutes. Um, so don't worry if something is not covered, is intentionally not covered, okay, for all sorts of uh, reasons, but those items will, will appear uh, at the next meeting. So uh, please don't panic. I I'm still awake, so that's good. <laughs> We're not going to miss it because of any other reason. So uh, declaration of interest, the register of all interest declared uh, has been circulated with the paper, so please check it out. However, if during the meeting, if there are any issues identified, which may be new to what you declared on the register already, please can you declare your interests at the time of the conversation happening, and then we'll update the register respectively. Uh, minutes from the previous meeting and any matters arising, um, I will take any feedback for accuracy first, please. Um, so minutes from the last meeting, which took place, so I'm just going to go to the front of that paper. So remind, I think it was the 24th of July. Uh, any, any observations on the accuracy of the minutes from anyone? Now I can see nods to negative, so thank you. Uh, Rachel, thank you very much for producing the minutes, uh, as always comprehensive uh, and accurate, so well done and thank you. Any matters arising? Alex. Hi, thank you. Um, it's just in relation to the community voices, um, which I think has, has been a really good programme, but I'm just intrigued to know where these 1300 responses or came from. So were they solely Great Yarmouth or were they Pan Norfolk? I guess I could guess the answer. However, we may have people in the room who are able to give us more uh, defined and accurate uh, information. So anyone from Community Voices on call? I can't see all attendees. So Shirley, are you are you able to help? I can see Shirley is there. I am here, Aliona. Uh, Paula's got her hand up and Paula might be uh, coming in to answer that one. I'll let her speak first. Excellent, uh, Paula. Yeah, oh, thank you. Right, thank you, thank you, Aliona. Apologies, Shirley, I didn't see you in the background. I was just going to reassure Alex that it's across Norfolk and Waveney system rather than within Great Yarmouth. And, and have they been analysed yet? We're in the process of doing that right now with, with Shelley and the team at the ICB, yes. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Uh, any other matters arising or questions from the last minutes? Um, I will have one just uh, is a comment. Um, Rachel, on page, oh, I can't see the page. But anyway, under the item of update number six, Spotlight on Children and Young People, um, where I've commented that it will be good to have an update later in, um, in a year uh, on the progress of uh, work in that area. Uh, can we put that on an action log, please, as well as our forward planner? Uh, but what really will be good to, to have is the uh, user's feedback, service user's feedback or patient's feedback. So uh, if we can just be more specific when we go back to Rebecca for an update, that in terms of the progress made and the difference the services and the improvements are making to our residents is to give us some examples uh, of that in terms of the impact and outcomes. So that is just clarification rather than um, anything else. OK, anything else from anybody else before we move on to the next item? No, I can't see any hands up and negative notes. Lovely. We'll move on. Thanks so much to the action log. Thank you, Rachel. So, um, OK, lived experience representative. Um, there are two items linked in a way to each other. So, uh, Paul, if you don't mind taking them both, so is uh, number four and number 10 with an update, please. Yep, sure. So in relation to the lived experience um, representative recruitment, um, I'm going to give a short update on that at the committee this afternoon. As you'll see with the papers, the final pack has been produced and that's been finalised and that's also been done in easy read version as well and we've worked with various different organisations and representatives and potential people um, where we've been going out and engaging with uh, people that have supported the development of those packs. Um, the only thing that we are waiting for now is HMRC approval on the rewards and recognition policy. Unfortunately, we can't go ahead and press the button to recruitment yet because we just haven't got that in place. But our finance team are working very closely with HMRC on that. And I think I said this at the last meeting, but I am fairly confident, hopefully, that very, very soon we should get the green light to go. And then as soon as we do, we will be able to go out and do that very um, important um, interest application process. OK, thank you. Mark. Thanks, Eliana. Thanks, Paul. And hi, Mark Burgess. I'm Director of Patients and Communities for the ICB. Um, just, just to kind of flag, this is incredibly frustrating, actually, but because all of us want these uh, per, per roles filled, they're really important to this committee. Um, but I just want to highlight that the, the poor teams across Paul's team uh, and finance colleagues and elsewhere have been really pushing to try and get this over the line. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 important we get it right. Absolutely, which we've, we've been looking at workarounds. We've been looking at what other alternatives we can do to to kind of fill a gap. Um, but unfortunately, um, as we. I'll put this carefully. HMRC work at a certain pace, which is uh, which is not necessary at the pace that we would like like to be resolved. But I didn't want anyone to think that that we're just dragging our feet on this. We're really pushing for it to be resolved, and hopefully for the next meeting we'll have a better better answer. Thanks. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Paul. Uh, and yes, I am I'm very aware of uh, the challenges, and I'm very aware how many people actually within the ICB at different levels are involved in trying to move this forwards. Um, but as I say, is a, a third party organization and they have their own speed. But let's hope that soon we'll get an answer. Thank you. Um, Paul, do you want to very quickly just the action is open, the action number six. Uh, anything else you want to add to what is on action log already? So a call's gone out to the wider ICS in relation to making sure that we've got an up to date organogram for comms and engagement leads across organisations. I can't yet finalise mine because we are in the middle of going through an, an organisational wide um, review of um, teams across the organisation. But needless to say, hopefully within the next few weeks, month, we should have an update on that and should be able to finalise it and circulate it around the group. Thank you, Paul. For those people who may see you for the first time do you want to tell people who you are please 
Yes, <laughs> huge apologies. So I'm Paul Hemingway, Associate Director for Comms and Engagement at the ICB. Thank you. So I have two hands up, Frankie and then Alex, please. Hi, Frankie Swords, the Medical Director of the ICB. Um, forgive me if I'm if I'm confused, but I think this action is confused. I think the action was to have an organogram of what the ICB and the ICS does, not what the comms and engagement teams do. And I think it's got a bit lost in translation. Um, so I think it's literally to make it a bit easier for when the public look on our website to say who does what, which committees are where. Uh, so I think it's perhaps got a bit muddled. Thank you, Frankie. Agree. Because I was not expecting yeah. the comms organogram, yeah. but the organization. So, yeah. Uh, Paul, can we still leave that action with you to help us to look at yeah. the wider picture? I think it's for you to pull it together rather than for you to tell us what every different comms team does. That's fine. Right. That's yeah. fine, Frankie. Unfortunately, I think, in my defence, I think this was um, action was agreed at a meeting when I wasn't here. I thought um, that's so what I just, had happened. I just relied on the actions. But no, that makes total sense. I'll follow that one up. And the lesson is, Paul, to be always here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Cathy has uh, confirmed that uh, we're right in our thinking. Alex. I was going to say exactly the same thing as Frankie. So she said it for me. Excellent. Look at this teamwork. That's great. Thank you. Now Paul probably is very clear what we're after. OK, thank you. Um, OK, so that's the action log. And uh, Rachel, as I mentioned earlier, if we add the uh, one related to children and people, mental health will be great. Um, moving on, uh, quarterly reports will start at Healthwatch Norfolk. Alex, over to you, please. I, I don't intend to talk to it because I'll make an assumption everyone's read it. But what I have done, I think, is demonstrate the breadth of work that we're undertaking, um, covering the whole of health and social care across Norfolk. Um, and I put hyperlinks to where there are reports available um, and that will continue. But I thought I, I'd end up writing reams and reams and reams, which people would just get very bored with otherwise. So I will shut it up now and take any questions that people may have. Alex, thanks so much. Uh, what you've done is what we've been asking for is a summary of what the report is about and then providing us the link. But can I just ask you, uh, again, benefit of anybody else who may be um, reading or listening to this the bullet point which has mhct what do that stands for do you know i was looking at that earlier and i suddenly thought i should have put that in full my apologize it's mental health community transformation thank you alex and yes uh, indeed that will be very helpful if we can have uh, you know terminology all uh, deciphered yeah. for everyone because not everyone works in health and all yeah. now all this so uh, thank you any questions from anyone okay frankie i can see your hand up uh, thank you um alex i thought this was really helpful the way you hyperlink but on the other hand um a couple of these for example the three hospitals three weeks um there's going to be so much in them that is important for us. I, I know I've looked on one of them already. I just wondered whether perhaps outside the meeting we could have a look at the um, the forward planner yeah. for the committee, because funnily enough, just in this month, Aliona and I have had a conversation about the National Cancer Patient Experience Survey and thinking, well, when does that come? And I think it might be useful just to have a, um, a, a visual really to say which we're bringing when, because I be I would hate to think these reports don't get the scrutiny they deserve because there's learning in them. Yep. That's correct, Frankie. Thank you. You sort of preempted also what I was going to say. Um Alex, the thing is again, we're relying on information from Health Watch for the findings to in decision making. So one of the questions I was going to ask is whilst the links are here, we can't presume that we can just look at them and suddenly make some decisions. How is this being fed into the system? for the system to consider that in decision making and improvements and so on, please. And then Mark, I'll come to you. Sorry, I was not here, I just cut in. So what Thank we are you. doing is um, a report for each hospital. So they will all be going to the chief exec. So the NNN actually is getting theirs this week, and that is the last of them. What we have done with that information is we are then compiling one report, which we will be taking to the Urgent and Emergency Care Board, courtesy of Mark, um, and to the committees in common for the three trusts. Um, and I can tell you, I mean, I can give you a very, very brief overview that there, there is no particular 
particular bad news in any of the trusts that people I think once they're in the system are actually quite content um, and recognize that there is a, um, uh, uh, you, you know, there have been delays and cancellations for a myriad of different reasons. So my next line of action is actually going to see if we can attack some of the waiting lists and actually find out whether people are being kept informed and up to date. So we will be wanting to work with the three trusts, which is what I will be recommending at the um, Urgent and Emergency Care Board and at the committees in common, um, uh, because we will need their help in order to contact people directly rather than going into it blind. Um, and, and there may be certain areas um, uh, that they would like us to concentrate on. Um, but what struck us uh, when we have been speaking to people outside of the three acutes is that if you're waiting, for example, for a hip hop or a, a knee replacement, uh, there's been a lot of people putting on huge amounts of weight. Um, and the, this is having an impact on their sort of day to day life. Um, and we're worried that, you know, if they become too bariatric, that they won't be able to have the surgery. Um, and, and, you know, the pain continues, the prescription of opiates continues and we're ending in an ever decreasing circle. So it's looking at ways which we can remedy that. But that's the next phase of this piece of work. Thank you. Um... Alex, uh, probably the same concept in relation to all the other uh, reports you've highlighted here, the pieces of work. So it'll be good if we can get sort of the key messages from those reports and to understand where they go into the system, please, if you can bring to this committee. Is that all right? Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark and then Tracy. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Alex covered one of the bits I was going to, which is the so what, what we're going to do with it. And Alex has highlighted there that some kind of critical next steps, because I think there's gold dust information in these reports for those that have read them, actually. It's re really good. But also good to hear for a change. We so often focus on the bad, don't we? And the uh, and the things we're not getting right rightly to, to think about what do we need to improve. But it's also very good to get the positive comments to see where we are doing well and what we could perhaps build on. So, uh, And the second point was just to say thank Thank you uh, to Healthwatch and Alex and his team actually for the way it's been done. It has been very well received by the hospitals as well. Um, a real kind of uh, a good example of cooperation across across multiple teams, multiple sectors. So uh, ju just to, to place on record my thanks, Alex, to you and the team. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Tracy. Yeah, I think it's building on. Um, oh, sorry, Tracy Williams. I'm the ICB's uh, clinical lead for health inequalities and inclusion health. Um, I'm also the place board chair for the Norwich locality. So kind of building on the use of the insights from these reports is is how we then can disseminate that again across the system, but actually how we can support how we're working at place within our health and wellbeing partnerships and our place board sort of working collaboratively. So I haven't had a chance to read many of the reports yet, some of them, but particularly the patient partners one, for instance, will be very informative. The, the, the pharmacy engagement will really help kind of support place-based work working in collaboration and what the needs are at place. So really keen how we can, you know, loop that in as well uh, would be an ask from me, really. Yep. Thank you, Tracy. Any other questions for Alex or observations or suggestions? OK, I can't see any more hands up. Alex, thanks so much. And thank to you uh, and your team for all the work. And yes, please, please highlight to us this committee uh, anything which is important for us to note and take forwards in the planning and thinking. OK, so thank we'll thank close you. to. Yeah, thank you. OK, uh, Health Watch Suffolk. Rachel, I think we have an apology for from Andy. Is that correct? Yes, we do. And I presume there is no one standing in for Andy either. No, unfortunately, yes? we weren't able to send anyone. OK, so there is literally information on one slide, I think, uh, which was sent to us, and it is about the survey for asthmatic young people age 11 plus. Uh, but I think that survey is covering Waveney only. Um, is it possible, please, to send a, a question for Andy or maybe maybe Alex now the answer? Um, is that specific to Suffolk and Waveney only that uh, survey or Norfolk is considering also? And if Norfolk doesn't, why this is a sort of a topic uh, which is being looked at uh, in the neighbouring 
housewives, but not an hours. And any, any insight basically into that, please, Alex, it, if you have. Yeah, sure. It's only been looked at in Waveney. It's not being looked at in Norfolk because it hasn't been an issue that has been raised by residents with this as an issue. Um, okay. And, our, and our, our, most of our work is um, led by the intelligence that we get when we're out and about talking to people. Okay. Thank you. So probably we'll ask uh, we'll ask Andy to give us an update on the results of that survey um, at uh, next meeting if that survey is over by then. Thank you, uh, Tracy. Yeah, just relating to kind of asthma and children, young people, we were successful with our core 20 plus community connector application for wave. I think it's wave four, actually. And we've predominantly our focus will be on children, and young people for that. And certainly the focus for that will be around um, long term conditions and asthma being one of those. So certainly in future, and that's linked to community voices and co-production. So certainly we hope to bring that back to this committee in due course when that's scoped out fully and we, we've got that work up. That certainly will be taking that further look at asthma and health inequalities and, and use and support. So that will come to you in due course. OK, Tracy, thank you. If you just uh, keep uh, Rachel in the loop as to approximately when that will be so she can. Ask yeah, we can do plan. that outside. Yeah. Yeah, very kind. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. I just thought it was an opportune moment um, just to put it on record. So we are supporting Andy and Health Watch Suffolk with um, this engagement work. We've got quite a bit lined up on social media as well as a few offline um, events and for forums and focus groups that we're supporting within the Great Yarmouth and Waveney area. But indeed, obviously, like Alex has said, if these do come up as an issue when raised by patients and families and carers in Norfolk, then we provide the same support from an ICB perspective. So um, I just wanted to mention that now that the ICB comms and engagement team is supporting this piece of work in Suffolk. OK, thank you, Paul. Thank you for um, bringing us in the loop, so to speak. Thank you. Any any other questions around HealthWatch work before we move to the next item? Nope. Negative nods. Thank you so much. Thank you indeed to everybody. Um, OK, uh, our spotlight item today is on all the people's strategy. And I think we have Sheila Glenn, who is going to take us through the work up to date. Sheila, I can't see you, but I'm sure you will appear in a minute. Yes, I, I can see me. I don't know. Whether, yeah, OK. Thank, I can thank see you, very you much. now. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> thank you very much, Aliona. Um, so my name is Sheila Glenn and I'm the Director of Planned Care and Cancer at the ICB and I'm working specifically um, on this uh, JFP uh, priority, Joint Forward Plan priority. So the paper that um, you have in front of you, and I, obviously we, we take that as read, but really that's just to outline um, where we've got to so far with the development of the, the vision um, and the strategy for ageing well in, in Norfolk and Waveney. It outlines all of the key work that we've undertaken to date and including the, the stakeholder engagement, which did include um, uh, uh, older residents and a review of current best practice and national recommendations. So we've spent a lot of time actually talking to people across referencing, looking at the what, what the evidence is, has been telling us. Um, the programme itself is a kind of, it's almost it's end to end, because if we talk about older people, then, but we also have a, a, a need to start earlier in the, the, the pathway, if you like, then what the programme is doing is, is almost splitting that journey of old age into three distinct areas because the interventions will be different depending on that. So the first stage is entering old age and that's where we want to be doing a lot more of the prevention of ill health, you know, health promotion, extending healthy active lives, etc. Then there's a transition phase, which is between that healthy, active life and frailty. And then we have the frailer older people, which is uh, the area, obviously, where we, we, we want to try and very much prevent patients in the moment going into hospital because we know all of the, the complications and the, the issues that uh, arise from that, um, both from the, the patient's point of view, but, but also from the system's point of view. Um, in terms of looking at the evidence that we looked at, we also identified um, specifically from the 
um, British Geriatric Society paper called Joining the Dots, which is very well researched, etc., and pulls on the best national and international evidence, that there's, there's seven areas that would have to un underpin any of our work and any of our changes across the ICS uh, to design and then deliver any um, services, but also the environments, the facilities to help the residents live longer, happier, healthier, healthier lives, which of course is, is our overall vision. Um, and just very quickly, I know they're noted in there, but I think it, it really helps put everything in perspective. The, the first area is about enabling independence and promoting well-being of older people and their carers. And it's it's quite important that when we do talk about our older people, a lot of the time we're actually talking about them not as an individual, but within their little family unit or their their, their, their carers, et cetera, because uh, again, that's absolutely essential for within our strategy. The second is population-based proactive and anticipatory care. So actually spotting things very quickly, doing what you can um, and making sure that patients aren't deteriorating. Uh, and that also brings in our, our prevention work as well. Facilitating integrated uh, urgent community responses, reablement, rehabilitation and intermediate care. Frailty attuned acute hospital care. And again, that's been based on some specific new evidence and some guidelines that have come out from uh, the British Geriatric Society to acute hospitals. So we'll make sure that those recommendations are embedded. Reimagining outpatients and ambulatory care for older people, enhancing healthcare support for long term care at home and in care homes, and providing coordinated, compassionate end of life care. And I think one of the things that just just reading those seven actually indicate is that this is not something that we can or should be doing on our own. This is definitely a system piece if we're going to address this these issues. And you're probably all aware because in terms of the the overall why. Um, one of the headlines that really struck me is, is that by you know 2040, the number of over 75s are going to increase by 55 percent. That that is that is enormous. And on top of that, not only will they increase in terms of number, but many of those people will be living with multi comorbidities. And we have a, a health system in particular that is very much based on individual conditions, individual specialties. <clears throat> so there's a lot of work actually that we're going to need to redesign that uh, to be fit for the future. Um, so the the actual program is is quite large and and wide uh, wide reaching, but its first objective really in terms of the JFP is is really to create that strategy and create it with older people and all of our partners, um, and not least our our places in terms of how that's going to be um, sort of enabled in, into the future. And just quickly, because I know it's probably better and easier if, if, if we talk about it because it's all in the paper, but we have a steering group. We've met on four occasions and that's been really just making sure that we keep on track and we're, we're developing and, and bringing in the right evidence and actually taking that information back to people and cross-referencing it and checking it again. Um, and as part of the strategy development, as I said, we have all of that, if you like, the sort of empirical evidence and, and best practice. Um, but we also want to do something about looking at what we've already got, because we know that within our places, within our district and, and local um, authorities, we have a lot of excellent work that's already going on. So we're undertaking a piece of work at the moment with our places, uh, just trying to identify what it is that we have there that maybe we'd want to build on. Because what we're not not looking for here is a one you know one size fits all or stop everything you're doing. We're coming out with a new strategy. So again, really important, and we'll be getting that back in the next um, few weeks, and we'll start to see where the gaps are, where the overlaps are, um, and that that will again feed into the the strategy. The strategy should be finished or, or will be finished by um, the end of December, and then there will be a roadmap by the end of March next year. And I suppose in conclusion, then, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the feedback, which was um, largely came from our workshop on, on the 23rd of May, um, we uh, and the research and the best practices, I said, that we, we've already done, um, we've got those seven priorities, which will support the overall strategic goal 
uh, anticipating and responding to age related problems and recognising the complex interactions of the physical, mental and social factors that can compromise independence and quality of life. So there's a, there's a huge amount of work actually gone on there and it's quite difficult without actually taking through every bit. So it's probably easier if we just, you know, talk talk that through, but happy to answer any questions. And of course, we've got our Frankie here as well, Frankie Swords, our medical director, who's also an integral part of this work. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much indeed. The report was very clear to you and your presentation was to the point. So thank you so much. Now, questions for Sheila. OK, Suzanne and then Tracy. Hello, I'm, I'm Suzanne Meredith. I'm, I'm Deputy Director of Public Health at Norfolk County Council, and I'm also Associate Director of Population Health Management at the ICB. And with both my hats on, I can see that this is a really important piece of work. Um, it's obviously vitally important to our um, system because of our, as Sheila has set out all the data and information about our population and our health needs, and and it's really filling a gap that we that we need to fill in terms of how we plan for, for this going forward because it it features heavily in everything we do in all our strategies and our population. So from a pop, from a public health perspective. Very, very uh, supportive of this. And also from the preventive side of things, of course, there's something about taking it even further back in terms of um, how we all deal with healthy behaviours and how we support prevention and healthy behaviours before we even get to the edge of your strategy and then you're, you, the sorts of people you're talking about. Um, I also see it very important from a population health management perspective in terms of the things you mentioned. And, and so that you can see there's so many crossovers and links with all the sorts of things we're doing in our system. The scope of this is massive. And I don't I think hope. we can underestimate how much you're going to have to put into doing all those connections that you've mentioned, because you've got you've got adult social care as well involved, and I'm sure, and all sorts of people. So what just wanted to say, very supportive of this. It, it's really um, hitting the nail on the head in terms of our needs for our population and what we need to put in place for the future. But you have mentioned, of course, the wider determinants of health, the, the role of district councils and so on, and all our other stakeholders and 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 um, people that we work with. So that's going to be vital. And I, I don't um, envy you the task of pulling this all together. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much, Susan. Thank you. Tracy and then Paula. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I um, it reiterate what Suzanne has just said, but just thinking at the moment, we are kind of working, I know from Suzanne's perspective, a population health management strategy is, is underway and the engagement and development of that. Our health inequalities one is underway. There's a primary care one. So just thinking about some opportunities that we can perhaps um, not do them jointly, but just join up with some of the engagement activities. Just thinking really when we're engaging perhaps with our our um, voluntary community sector organisations that are going to be essential within the space of supporting, you know, our, our, our ageing population and certainly some of the, the engagement we already do with the community voices. So I think if there's opportunities to join up, it, most welcome that, Sheila. So I'm sure that you can be in touch with us and we can think how we might want to do that um, over the coming months ahead. Absolutely. So if I, if I can pick that up. One of the things uh, I mentioned that we're looking at what, what are the services, et cetera, that are out there in places. But we also need uh, have, have identified that what we need to do is to map all of the strategies. Um, because, I mean, you know, Suzanne really hit the nail on the head. This is exceptionally complex because we're, we're not starting from just a nice blank sheet and, you know, you can work uh, systematically through. So actually understanding what's out there and even finding that as, as being, you know, quite complex. So we will be coming out to places and also to organisations as well because they have their own strategies. So I heard NCHNC, for example, have a, an older people's strategy. And I'm thinking, you know, so everywhere it, it starts mm -hmm. to get very, very confusing. So we've got to somehow bring those together, see where we've got the, the, the overlap, are we heading in the same direction, and then understand that in terms of our strategy, it will be quite high level. Um, but we will be looking to provide that kind of framework and there'll be some things as well that we would want to see specifically across. And they are things like, to, you know, to do with um, maybe how we assess our patients and, you know, comprehensive geriatric assessment, that, that they are the absolute fundamentals because we, we all need to build on the same thing and be talking the same language. So uh, absolutely. So I will I will be coming out to you. But thank you very much for you know reminding us of that, Tracy. Thank you, Sheila. And of course, uh, economy of scale and also working together and stop duplication is quite important. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 
Okay, Paula and then Kathy. Thank you, Aliona. Uh, Paula Boyce, Great Yarmouth Borough Council here representing the Eight Health and Wellbeing Partnerships. Um, just, just to say, Sheila, um, really, really supportive of this, and I speak on behalf of all Eight Health and Wellbeing Partnerships. Um, at, whilst there might be eight to get round, it would be really helpful because I think each of those partnerships has about 30 partners within it. And uh, completely agree it's a big piece of work really important very happy to help and um having having a framework overview will, will help pull everybody together thank you that's brilliant thank you very much thank i will you. come back to you paula because I, I in some ways i don't know who i don't know if you see what i mean so um that would really help well done kathy Thank you, Aliona. So I'm Cathy Armour and I'm um, a non-executive member of the ICB. So, so my question is, if I'm well and I'm entering old age and so I'm not going to the GP or I'm not being picked up with voluntary or, you know, voluntary groups, how am I going to be reached by this strategy to, to prevent me from becoming unwell and then being in the system, if you like? So how do you keep me out of, of the system? So I'm sure I'm entering into that phase. <laughs> and there's some of the things, I mean, Frankie might want, oh, so Frankie's got a hand up. I'll let, let Frankie go first. Uh, thanks, Thank Sheila. Uh, Frankie, Medical Director. Um, that is exactly why we've um, divided the, the population into those three cohorts, because when we had our workshop and just to reiterate at the start of this process, we didn't start with the best practice. We started with our people. And we had 85 people together saying, what do you want? And we heard loud and clear over and over again, you need to listen to us. You need to involve our carers more. And we want to get in early and plan ahead. So at the point of diagnosis of dementia, say when somebody's still completely living independently, they may well still be working full time, but they've had a few very early issues. They want to know ahead. They want the roadmap. Well, what's going to happen in two years time, in five years time, in 10 years time? Give me somebody, give me a central, easy person to call for whatever it is. Help me to help myself. So that's exactly why we've we've formulated the process in, in this way. So what are we doing to maintain independence before? And so, yeah, that's we haven't got the answer, but we've at least got a framework to try and find the answer yeah. and to try and reach out in that way, Cathy. Yeah, and that, okay. that's Sorry, that, that's one area that I think um, we, we can particularly work with our um, council colleagues, because if we're talking even further upstream than that, so how do you stay healthy? Um, yeah. You know, so what is the offer? What is the offer in this place for somebody who lives there who is maybe, I mean, I don't know how far we go back, but, you know, maybe starting at 50. So what what what, are, what is the offer there to be able to keep me healthy, keep me going, keep me active? Um, what do I need to do when things do start? to to change one place to go to etc but that that might be slightly different in each of the places as such yeah okay all right thank you thank you do you want to add to that yes Aliona at the start of the meeting you reminded us all to declare our conflicts and I think we all need to declare a conflict that we're all planning all for old. our older age <laughs> <laughs> no we're all looking ahead so this absolutely affects every single member of our population because we live here and whether we're talking about our older relatives and neighbours and friends or ourselves actually you know, this is about all of us. Mm. Thank you Frankie I'll piggyback to your example of dementia if uh, I might please um when we look at the patient pathway, uh, yes, if they identify themselves early and they may not need much help at this moment in time, are we considering the preventative measures and the early intervention rather than just saying, yes, there is going to be dementia support when you get to age of 75 because we have somebody in place. Please, can we get the assurance that we're looking across the system and not just at the obvious things because there are interventions which are not that obvious to healthcare professionals which can prevent the decline of dementia yeah so it's just i'm looking for the reassurance that we are looking outside the box uh, and not just in the dementia area i just use that as an example uh, please but um a quick question um sheila the 55 percent when i was reading is uh, actually was quite Shocking. How is the modeling done to reach such a percentage increase? Do we know? Oh, I might I might hand that one to Suzanne because it came from public health. I'm not quite sure. So is that 
Say that again, please, Ali. Ali, Ali. So the, the point two, where it talks about by 2040, modeling suggests the number of people over 75 will increase by a further 55%. How is that modeling done to get this kind of percentage? Well, we've got we've got that I can provide the modeling. Um, I think it's probably easier for me to provide that than to try and explain it on at the, at this. We've got we've got slides that, that show that I can provide that to go with mm. the, the minutes. Lovely. That will be extremely helpful. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you. OK, any other uh, questions for Sheila or comments or observations from anybody? I can't see any raised hands, and uh, there were some comments in charts, but please pick them up. Uh, I can't keep an eye on both because I'll lose track of things. So uh, anyway, uh, we will minute the, any any comments uh, from the chats in our minutes. Um, so nothing else. Sheila, uh, thank you so much. Thank you to your team, you. and good luck with this good work. It is a big piece of work. Mm -hmm. Please, please talk to everyone concerned because there'll be lots of help around. You're not alone, uh, but it's all about uh, yeah working jointly. But good luck, and we'll look forward to hearing next time when you get closer to the draft strategy. It will be interesting to yeah. see where we got. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. If you're leaving, you're welcome to stay if you want. OK, uh, Frankie, I think we are moving on to you now, running a few minutes late, uh, but is uh, changes to the prescribing of over-the-counter medicines, please. Thank you, Aliona. So I won't go through every detail of this paper, but I think the first thing to note is that as an NHS, we are and a country, we are facing severe financial challenges. So we have a duty to make the very best use of every pound that we have and try and reserve every pound that we have for the things we most want to do. In light of this, we, we've got two parallel pieces of work going on, one to look at medicines and the other to look at procedures, operations and so on. And we're doing this in two ways. And I just wanted to really use this opportunity to ensure people understood why we're doing it and how we're doing it. So if we start with the um, medicines, NHS England has put out national guidance and it, and it gets refreshed every year to say what medicines should and shouldn't be provided on prescription. So for example, if you have a self-limiting and minor condition like sunburn, for example, or hay fever, and if there is, so if the condition is likely to resolve on its own, so it's not going to lead to a permanent or, or debilitation, and if the treatments are readily available and available over their, their counter, or if the treatment's been shown actually not to make terribly much difference when you do a big study looking at, you know, hundreds and thousands of people with this condition who do or who don't take that supplement, for example. And they've issued a list of medicines and, and um preparation, so things like bath oils or vitamins or mouthwashes, which they do not think that we should be prescribing because we need to reserve the NHS's money for what we really have to do. And so the first part of this paper is really just to highlight that we are putting out new guidance to all of our GP surgeries to say, look, for heaven's sakes, you absolutely should prescribe it for this, but not for that. And along with it, there's, there's national resources for, pe for people who take these or use these um, uh, substances and there's also local so there'll be letters and information available on the website but if somebody's been used to having it on prescription they will be informed to say actually this is why it's not going to be on prescription anymore or if somebody just comes for the first time and says actually could you prescribe me some paracetamol and you know to really give the GP a backing to say actually no it's easier and cheaper for you to buy that over the counter in this instance. So that's that's where we are in terms of the, the medicines and products. In terms of the procedures, it's slightly different and it's very much about procedures that do or don't have the evidence that they make a difference. And so, again, there, there's national guidance around this. For example, if you have a child who has a sore throat once, there's no evidence to say that having their tonsils out will make any difference long term. But if you have somebody who's had tonsillitis multiple times and it's affecting their breathing, it's affecting their hearing, it's affecting their schooling, it's a completely different position. And so really this is just to sort of highlight that that leads us to develop things called clinical threshold policies. And so in the paper, 
There's a couple of examples. So one is about cosmetic breast surgery and another is around tonsillectomy. In both those cases, we're sort of tightening up in terms of who could have that treatment on the NHS. On the other hand, the cataract policy has actually been expanded because we, we now recognise that actually having your cataract done slightly earlier will maintain your independence for longer. So actually it really is worth doing that, but that will mean more people get it. And then there's a, a, the final one, female sterilisation. Actually, we've never had a policy on that before, but we've realised, in fact, the reason we realise this is because we, we came across hundreds of people waiting and ever such a long time for this operation. We thought, goodness, isn't there something else we could do about that? And when we review against lots of other systems around the country, we realise that actually lots of other systems will say, well, come on, there's a very much more effective, easier, cheaper, quicker alternative to female sterilisation these days. One is long acting reversible contraception and the other is male sterilisation. They're both quicker, easier, less risky. You know, you really should have that first. And of course, there'll be exceptions and these policies take into account those exceptions. But the rationale is really to make sure that we preserve the resources we have for what really does make a difference and what's what's most important. But I thought it was really important that our patients and our public and our community sort of understand that these are difficult decisions that we have to make, but they're important. And so we're quite keen to do it in an open uh, way. And so this is the first tranche, but as others come through, I would I would request that I can bring them here as well. So I, I won't go into lots of detail, that, but that hopefully gives you a flavour. Thank you so much, Frankie. Yes, it does. Um, any questions for Frankie? May I start, Frankie, whilst people are thinking? Of course. Um, in terms of paracetamol, you, you gave the example of paracetamol, but there will be other medication. Yeah. And yes, some people get the medication which you can get, get over the counter mm -hmm. on prescription. Um, and yes, they will be cheaper if you're not to pay the prescription, they're cheaper to buy over the counter. However, there are people who are, are exempt from paying for their prescription mm -hmm. because of the benefit packages they may be on and so on. Yeah. What is the impact? Do we now the value of the impact in Norfolk and Waveney, and Waveney will be on patients who currently do not pay for their prescription, but they may be getting medication on that prescription which can be bought over the counter. I'm just thinking about people not actually being able to afford the basic medication we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Have we looked at that impact? So that is first question. And I suppose my my first answer to that question is a, is a confession that paracetamol is a really bad example, which I gave you. <laughs> but it is a really bad example because it's not actually on this list. Because <laughs> we're not we're not stopping that. But but just but using it as an example take, for, for like yeah. or, or things like that. You know, there can be many medications, yeah, yeah. but medications which we now they're not expensive. So, <laughs> when when people are receiving that, so laxative is a, is a really good idea. So if somebody uh, is living with chronic pain and they're on a lot of medication for their pain and as a consequence they need to have laxative um, as part of their treatment, it would absolutely still be part of their treatment. It's more if somebody presented with simple constipation, actually, do you know what, some some apple juice or a few prunes in the morning would be a better idea. And that yeah. is what we'd like. We'd like that common sense approach. Um, okay. But we can we can pull the data on how much we spend on on individual drugs which are available over the counter. But it's a bit false because we're not removing them from all indications. It's just from these specific indications. Well, you just very helpfully clarified uh, something because we just need to make sure the GPs also understand that yes. guidance. And yeah, Absolutely. The, the, the other question for me was the aesthetic cosmetic breast surgery. OK. Yes. I am sure there is provision for um, members of our community who may need that because of the gender assignment. Uh, that is going to be seen on case by case basis. Yeah, we're not just saying is aesthetic because there's different views. So, you know, um, so. actually, so gender services are um, governed separately because they're governed through specialist commissioning, which is at the moment. I can say this until the end of March, uh, not um, not up to the ICB. So they're nationally commissioned and you have to go through a, a specialist gender clinic. But using the breast uh, surgery example, it's yep. a good example because if somebody has had um, uh, trauma, somebody's had a terrible car accident and it's damaged the shape of their breast, somebody's had cancer surgery, 
those people are completely exempted from this policy. Of course, that's a that's absolutely part and parcel of their of their general treatment. And if somebody needs um, breast surgery because they have huge asymmetry with terrible back pain or terrible issues with their neck because of you know things like mm -hmm. that, again, that it that would meet the threshold. But on the other hand, um, if it is not for those reasons, then it then it it wouldn't meet the threshold. And then that person would have to put in what's called an individual funding request or an IFR, for which we have a whole process where people can say, actually, I'm exceptional. There's a reason why I'd like you to consider me, even though I don't fall into the standard categories. This is why it's different for me. And you make the case and we have a, a, a process. And so on case by case basis, absolutely, it may be absolutely the right thing to do. But as a rule, it is not yep. something that we would provide. Thank you so much. Very helpful clarification. Thank you, Frankie. Tracy. Yeah, no, thank you, Frankie. And thank you for your questions, Eliana. They're really interesting and, and good to listen to. Just thinking, I'm sure that's the case that with all of the proposals and as they work through, there'll be an equality impact assessment undertaken yes. in respect of those. So Absolutely. that's good to hear. Just going back to kind of the over the counter medications. And I mean, that's often, you know, in primary care, we try very hard not to prescribe those things that can be bought over the counter. And sometimes it, it can be quite challenging. So any kind of support for primary care and that kind of approach and how to um, have those conversations with you know with our patients would be greatly appreciated and just thinking about some of the socioeconomic impacts so certainly the work that I'm involved in with inclusion health groups particularly those experienced homelessness are asylum seekers in contingent hotels they have eight pound a week to spend so you kind of have to have that discretion I guess for some mm. of our more um, underserved communities that wouldn't have any any yeah. funds to basically obtain those purchases so I guess there is that discretion at the same time as well isn't there I would hope there is there is and and I think uh, the way you put that was exactly right Tracy in a way this is us trying to make it very clear to primary care that we've got your back and actually that we will support you um, both with um, with sort of rules and regulations to wrap around you but also with um, patient communications and and there's a lot of national information as well to say actually this isn't a, a a particular GP surgery or, you know, you terrible getting anything out of them. No, actually, this is something that we all need to do across the board because we do need to reserve what, what resources we have. We have got to spend on the things that we've decided are the absolutely most important, uh, yeah. which is which is hard. Yeah. Frankie, thanks so much. Kathy, you and then we'll move on to the next item, please. OK, thanks. I was just wondering, Frankie, when if something is not covered currently, um, but there is a demand, but the answer is always no, because it's not, there isn't a policy for it. How how does that get, I, the, re, the example I'm thinking of is people who have bariatric surgery and then they're left with folds, aren't they, of, of excess skin. But that re, that removal of that skin is not, is not covered, is it? So, but if this, if, you know, it's that if we're encouraging people to lose weight and then they, they lose weight and they're left with, or they have surgery and they're left with lots of skin. How, how do, if that demand is really built up, how, how does that ever get kind of um, highlighted, flagged and become part of a clinical so policy? So the, um, we, we have policy on it, <laughs> funnily enough, Kathy. So um, if I think it is five cases, uh, five individual funding requests coming through on the same issue will then trigger a commissioning review to see actually if right. there are five people who are all exceptional maybe there's a whole cohort of people for whom right. we should be reconsidering so that would trigger us to reconsider whether or not to to commission i.e you know book and pay for something or not that's not right. to say that the answer is automatically yes because we yeah. might not be able to fund it but it would trigger us to review the evidence and we work closely with a, a member of Suzanne's team actually one of our public health consultants right. uh, who will look into the public health impact of the treatment as well as the cost of the treatment uh, to to help guide whether a commissioning um, decision is required or not. Right. But yeah, okay. there, there's a policy and it's literally and the the individual funding request team who I know you work with will yes. will will say uh, uh, we've had three of these this year. Right. We need to trigger a review. Three. Right. I can't actually remember whether it's three or five, but uh, okay. but I know we All have right. a, a process. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Frankie. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, Frankie, thank you for all the work. And I'm very pleased to see that the contract has been reviewed because there's lots of evidence to demonstrate that the earlier the surgery, the lesser 
decline yes. in dementia when there is a link between the two of them. So well done. And uh, yeah, upwards and onwards. Thank you, Frankie. Uh, moving on, I think we're going to go to John Pant, who is not with us, but I think, Mark, you have agreed to take that item. Is that right? On yes. complaint report, please. Thank you. And I'll be very brief. Unfortunately, John's sick, so he does have an, a good excuse not, not to be here. So the, the report that's been uh, brought today, just to give you an overview, is it's a fairly high level. And I'd suggest actually we might want to explore some of these in a bit more detail at future meetings in particular areas. But the kind of five areas the report highlights around not just complaints, but also uh, common themes, issues that are raised to us at the ICB. Uh, and, and I suspect none of these will be a particular surprise. GP access to appointments, access to dentistry, waiting times for elective surgery, housebound vaccinations, uh, quite a few contacts, 281 report highlights uh, around that, but that's more around queries and eligibility and can this happen, uh, and also continuing health care. So um, uh, accepting this is quite a high level report, welcome thoughts, views of committee members about is there any particular area that we'd like to focus on and have a bit more detail, a bit more of a breakdown around what's behind those numbers. Um, because again, I think that's going to be useful information that we can then use to help shape the improvements that we're already seeking to make, uh, let, let's be honest, in a number of these areas. But so apologies, I can't present this as well as uh, John, but just a, a few few things there to be considered. And I think worth worth a quick discussion on if, if, if you're happy. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, a couple of things from me, please, Mark, before people think of question. Uh, I would welcome uh, more of a breakdown. Uh, very curious to find out more about the uh, complaints regarding GP access. What exactly do we mean by that? Uh, so how is that breaking down into different areas? It could be accessibility, it could be face-to-face -face versus telephone versus vi virtual, it could be quality, it could be whatever that is. So if we can have that breakdown, uh, the same with the continuous healthcare, if we can understand exactly what the queries were about. Um, and the second one is how this information then is used or how, currently how the complaints team are using the information which comes to them and the natures of the complaints to then link back to the system to demonstrate that there is issues and how we're going to, you know, what are we going to do to address them. So it's just to understand how the complaints team actually influences and impacts and yeah. informs um, the, the system development work, please. If we can have yeah, that so, in the next month's report, will be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would, would you like me to attempt to answer it now as well? As, as again, at a high level, I accept. I <laughs> so I think that this committee is a key part of that going forward. But the other one is that the, these complaints, as they come in, they do the complaints team are very good. Are linking with our commissioning teams to highlight this information. And actually, in many cases, when the complaints are raised, it is our teams that are investigating, responding, providing the complaints team with the information that follows. So. Uh, Th that's at a high level, some of the detail around that, but but it would be good to uh, bring it back here with a bit more bit more detail. So I'll, I'll log that as well. That Thank as you, action. Mark. C can you then also ask how the commissioning team then links to the quality team? Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. it's not just about what we commission, but what is commissioned, yep. what, yeah, uh, how they perform. Absolutely. Okay, in terms of quality. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, it just links to um, what Mark's just said in a way in, in terms of feedback directly influencing commissioning decisions. So just to um, provide another example, so on a weekly basis, what John Punt and his team have started doing now with my team is providing a very broad summary of some of the things that are coming in, whether that's topical, whether that's on a timely basis. For example, vaccination, eligibility, where do I go for this? What can I do for that? So all this information is basically being fed through to our team and then we're using that information to either update policies or we're using it to update information that's on the website in relation to vaccination, for example. So that is that information is being used literally as soon as it comes in within five working days um, and it's been used to kind of inform FAQs and things like that. So that's just one small example, but it's just a, an important one to note that actually what we're trying to do is minimise the number of further inquiries that we might get about a particular issue or subject as a result of providing that information that may be a gap that's raised to us. Thank you, Paul. May I also suggest that we consider um, 
sort of informing the public a little bit more about what's available. And that's where my conflict of interest comes in. Um, I work for an organization who is a provider of uh, some services for the local NHS. And yes, the complaints team been in touch asking if they are domiciliary visits. They are. <laughs> they delivered, but people don't know. So I think maybe we need to think about the current provision. How is because yes, providers will make the you know advertise themselves or market or promote their services. But I'm just wondering if there is a way of system wide, wide, wide system wide uh, promotion and uh, uh, of yeah and public education basically of the current services available and how they're delivered. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up, so I will assume there is no further questions. Mark, thank you, and uh, uh, we'll uh, wish John a speedy recovery, and we'll look forward to the next month's more in-depth report, if that's okay. Thank you. Ian, we're going to move on to digital transformation program updates. So, Ian Riley, are you with us? I am, Aliana. Can you see me? Excellent. I can't see you yet, so I'll see you in a minute. Hello and welcome. Um, I still can't see you. I, uh, did you switch on your camera, Ian? I have, I have yes. Uh, am I not I visible? I can see you. I can see you. Uh, can okay. see you. <laughs> if you start talking more, probably you will appear on my screen in a minute. Ian, okay. uh, over to you, please, if you just tell everyone who you are and uh, do remember we have read the papers, so please pick up on the key items so we can then have a discussion. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Ali. I hope you can hear me and see me properly. So uh, welcome. Good afternoon. I am Ian Riley. I am the Director of Digital and Data for the ICB and also work right across the ICS trying to uh, bring the providers together and, and help get our digital maturity uh, greater. So it's nearly 12 months since we launched the digital strategy right across our ICS. And we've got lots of providers that make up the ICS and they all have different levels of, of their IT systems and availability to staff. So a lot of what we're trying to do is to get the best computer systems to our staff so that they can see information about our patients because health and social care is quite good at having lots of pieces of the jigsaw of a patient's information all over the place. So I think what we're trying to do a lot with the strategies, A, give staff the best systems to work with, but bring all that data together about a patient. So patients don't have to keep repeating their story time and time again, and staff have the best information to make the best decisions. So the paper's quite long. Uh, there's a lot going on and still a lot to do. So th there may be things that we want to drill into in a second and maybe we want to bring back an update on more specific areas but i think what i wanted to say also is as as we we're very conscious that as we roll out more and more things in the digital space that we're very careful about digital inclusion for our patients and our citizens because it's very easy to leave people behind in this space so there's lots of work that you can see and lots of work we're doing with norfolk county council to make sure that we make IT available to people who don't have it, give them the necessary skills to keep up with this agenda because there is a real risk that we can leave some people behind. So I'll take the papers read and um, that's the introduction. So thank you, Aliona. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Um, so I'll wait to see some hands. No hands at the moment. So if I may, I'll kick off the, the questions. Three of them straight away for you, please, Ian. The NHS app, um, completely agree, is very good app to have and it will be good for us to promote it more. Uh, however, the prescription part of it uh, is not always quite there. So even if you need the prescription within two days, the app says you can't have it. So you have to go to the GP's website to then or phone or whatever the methodology may be. So I'll just leave you that thought that NHS app is great, but sometimes it has hiccups on it. The second question, the single electronic patients record, you're talking about free hospitals having um, why not the other healthcare providers? What's happening there? Again, I'm sure there is a reason, but just to have that understanding. And the third one, virtual wards, um, is the QE in the queue to start some of that or not Queen Elizabeth Hospital, I mean. So that is the three questions from me, and then I'll move to Kathy. Okay, thank you, Aliana. Uh, do you want me to take Kathy's question first or come back to yours? Kathy, you happy to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, happy to add it. So mine was about the East of England Ambulance Trust and the six uh, <laughs> six records that they have to 
potentially look at. So, and you've said that there are national going to be national solutions to that, perhaps. And I just wondered whether you knew, because often if it goes national, it kind of doesn't doesn't happen. So, if, whether you knew what the progress was there or the options. Thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, yeah, I'll go through this. So NHS app, I, I think, yeah, uh, you're right, Talia, there, there are frustrations. It's still being developed and being developed all the time. And actually, we, we've got an update at our next uh, digital board from the national team. So there are still frustrations with it. Uh, e prescribing comes up a lot. So it is being developed and it's getting better all the time, but it isn't quite quite where it needs to be. So, so we're working with the national team. We're also working with the practices and, and the patients to get people to sign up to it. And I think it will get better. I'm sure it'll get better, but it, we, we're pushing pressure on. So I think you're right to, to point that out. It's, it's not perfect yet, but it is getting better all the time. Yeah, um, and before before I forget just on that one, I know Frankie put in the chat that is for routine prescriptions. It was routine prescriptions people trying to get <laughs> and they can't. So my concern will be only how much we promote the app and the functionality and let's not mislead people and frustrate them even more. So that's what I was really highlighting. Sorry for, for barging you. Thank you. Ian. No, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. the, the electronic patient records, so the EPR, as people refer to, so, so you're right, there is a, a plan at the moment to put it in across our three acute hospitals and join them all together. Um, it would be good if we could join everybody together, but those the systems don't always work in that way. So they, at the moment, there tends to be electronic patient records for acutes and then one for mental health, and then community tend to use the same as our primary care colleagues. So there are national moves to try and change that. I think Mid and South Essex are trying to test the market in terms of can you put one system across everything, but currently there isn't one. So, so at the moment we're, we're buying a system for our three acutes, our mental health providers looking for another one in the future maybe, uh, and our community providers tend to use the same as community. So we're getting there. I think some of, some of it is getting the data out and, and linking that together rather than everybody having the same system. Um, virtual ward, I might look at whether Frankie can just answer that one, if that's all right, I don't. Know. Uh, yes, of, of course. Sorry, so, so the um, the QEH virtual the QEH virtual ward has been at a slightly different pace and has a sl has had a slightly different sort of um, history to the other two, but it is now live. And the, uh, the so there is um, uh, they use HomeLink uh, to provide some of their uh, virtual their care in people's homes, but the new step up model, which is uh, to support people at home instead of an admission to hospital rather than after an admission to hospital you go home earlier and you report and are supported by the virtual ward that's called the step down so the new mm -hmm. step up virtual ward uh, went live uh, on the 18th of september in the center of our patch and is extending to the west i think it's next week uh, so it's it's imminently and it's a fully integrated between the nchc community team and the queen elizabeth team Excellent. Thank you, Frankie, because of course we need to think about patients' equality of access to services. Yeah. So we, we really shouldn't be having the postcode yeah. lottery. Yeah. But the um, but all of the virtual wards now use the same um, platform. So whichever one the patient has been admitted to, IC24 are now able to review those records. It, it's Excellent. it's really, really, really coming on now. Whereas before it was a very specific one in the Norfolk and Norwich. There had been a very specific COVID related one at the QE, and there's a very specific one around acute medicine at the Paget. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. OK. Can I just take Cathy's question? Yes, you? please, of course. Um, so, yeah, you're right, Cathy. I think um, East of England Ambulance Service struggle because I think every ICB, ICS can choose their own shared care record and roll it out. And so we've got quite a few different ones across the East of England. So there are a couple of things. Nationally, they, they've pulled in, I think there's nine different suppliers of, of shared care record systems. So nationally they're trying to make them talk to each other something called interoperability so mm. you don't necessarily have to have the same systems but those systems talk to each other the ambulance service is looking at something called the, the national record locator which is another method where they can get the data also and we're having some conversations locally as well so for our Waveney uh, practices um, our neighboring ICS SNE has a complete different system as well so we're, we're just trying to work it out all those different levels so locally as an ICS regionally and the national team are trying to help out as well so it's a problem at the moment we're, we're working on it at all the different levels so okay lovely thanks Ian thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Cathy, Cathy triggered also for me to, to to ask about the question of 
particularly palliative care patients. Frankie, you may be able to help me here. What is the document called? Respect? Well, the last, you know, the wishes. Is that respect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Recommended summary of, I can't remember uh, what the last few, that is <laughs> care and treatment. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, my, my question, thank you, Frankie. My question is, if we do have all these systems and they may not be talking to each other at the moment and not sharing the information, how do we make sure that if people do live that form, life, the respect form, how do we make sure that whatever service comes in, they know about it? So I don't so know the, if there the, is any flagging up on all the systems or whatever you may put in place. Mm -hmm. the, the, the key to that is the shared care record, because the shared care record is, as it says, what is shared between all the different providers. So um, and a digitised respect form is being produced and will shortly be included on that. But for now, it's referenced within System 1. So within GP records, if somebody has a respect form, it is flagged on, on the System 1. Unfortunately, not every patient who should have had a respect conversation has had one yet, and, and not all of them are in their GP records. But that's that's the answer to that question, the shared care record. Thank you. So if the patient is picked up by the ambulance service, would they still see that or the um, hospital? Uh, respect forms are carried by the patient. So um, so when I do a clinic, some patients will literally have it with them. So okay. so if an ambulance arrives at a, a person's home, they ought to be able to, to see it in the person's home, a little bit like your maternity record. Although there's a digital system, people will still wander around with their bounty packs because it's a handheld record by the person. Um, and because it's so um, so important, but because it can change, because of course people can change their minds, at the moment um, the recommendation is very much that you go with the copy held by the patient. So even if you've got one in the hospital records from two years ago, say, well, that might not be valid anymore. Mm -hmm. They may have completely changed their their the person's situation may have completely changed and they may have a different set of wishes now, which they agreed last week with their GP and they've got it in their handheld respect form not the one you might have filed from a few years ago. So that's why it's really important that it's handheld, but a digital version is being produced. Okay, so in a way, reminding patients to do that, uh, yes. to, to have their record and understand, then provide us to understand that they need to look for the latest version is yes. quite vital in this. Lovely, yes. thank you. Any other questions for Ian? Ian, I can't see any hands up, so no more questions, And uh, but thank you very much, Ian, for, for updating us. Uh, lots of work is going on, um, lots of good work indeed. Please remember about those residents who do not have access to digital technology. They still need to be able to know what's what. Uh, so please do not forget about that cohort of people in your thinking. Thank you, Lovely. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank you and thank you to your team. OK, moving on, we are going to go on to Daniel, uh, who is going to update us on the integration with volunteers and community sector. Daniel, welcome. Uh, hi. I th hi, I think you have a slide deck which hasn't been put in a pack in advance. So maybe, Rachel, if you can share it. But Daniel, don't read page by page. Just give a summary of everything. So then we have the time to ask for questions, please, if that's OK. Absolutely fine, Aliona. Thanks ever so much. So. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you very much, Rachel, for sharing that. Um, so my name is Daniel Williams. I um, have been working within the ICB as the VCSE partnering lead for the last six months. My background is almost entirely voluntary community social enterprise. I've been working for too long in Norfolk in the sector. Um, and so it's been a real pleasure to come on board with the ICB. Yeah, yeah, Rachel, please, please put that up. That's great. It's been a real Pleasure to come on board with the ICB and um, and start working through our proposals for next steps with the, with the Assembly. Rachel, I can't see the slideshow myself. Can everybody else see it? No, they disappeared. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Here it is. Brilliant. OK, first slide, please, Rachel. So I will just whistle through, but I wanted to at the start just just set this into context. The last six months of work is actually just an extension of work that's been going on way ahead of the formation of the ICS uh, from a VCSE assembly that was originally chaired by Tony Osmansky um, and then a piece of work commissioned by uh, by Community Action in Norfolk to develop a memorandum of understanding. Um, you'll all be aware of the appointment of Emma Ratza as our chair back in 21 and when the ICB um, launched um, we had a number of place leads that formed our emerging assembly. 
And then that last bit is um, myself coming on board with the roadmap. Thanks. Next one, Rachel. Um, just reminding again of the of the clear ambitions of what it is we're trying to achieve with assembly. We've had a couple of references already today when we're looking at the older person strategy of of looking at the wider determinants of health and looking beyond just um, direct healthcare inputs. And I think this is where the sector has a huge role to play. Um, so providing VCSE engagement form across Norfolk and Waveney to focus on inequalities and prevention with connection at neighbourhood and place. We have one of the most incredibly diverse um, sectors for the voluntary community social enterprise in Norfolk. Um, and, and, it, and it really responds to need. And, and indeed, a lot of the provision is born of those health inequalities in our communities, providing a mechanism to support collaborative design and also increasing the influence and participation of VCSEs across that design. And with four strategies for the ICB currently um, in development, a really important time for us to be able to tap into that wealth of lived experience from the sector to ensure that those strategies um, are holistically targeting our client groups. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm going to skip past this one quite fairly quickly. That was the original structure for our VCSE assembly. I think the thing I want to point out most clearly is um, just a really the connection between the board, uh, which is chaired by Emma and a number of constituents, you can see down the left and the place leads. There was there's no executive management resource in that space. And obviously, with the places being new, as well as those place leads being new, a lot of learning uh, needed to take place in here. So next slide, next slide, please, Rach. So I'm just going to focus on that learning. Really, the bulk of what I've been doing over the last six months has been working with uh, partners just to review what we've learned. I have also been and continue to be a place lead from in Norwich. So I've got direct experience on the place board, on the partnerships um, and, and doing that direct representation work. So what did we learn? I think well constituted. You know, we were one of only two um, ICBs in the country with a, uh, a VCSE chair sitting on the main board with full voting rights. And I think that's been really useful, certainly for me, uh, culturally and for our sector to have that uh, leadership to tap into and to bring that around the leadership table. The VCSE sector and the sector leaders are are tired. We are, we are you know, as with you know, an awful lot of our statutory providers, it has been uh, a tough, I'm going to say 15 years since the start of austerity for our sector. Uh, so they see another another initiative coming along like an ICB and they are probably quite rightly cynical. We need to be careful with our time. Why should we be investing in here? What's different? I think the most important lesson is to get the resourcing right and the lead officer at place we appointed a number of different um, experienced um, representatives at place um, and not all of them have worked well. So the exit interviews from those that haven't worked well, both with the individuals and the ICB and ICS partners have really informed our next step steps. The joint working has been fundamental. Um, I was able to go straight to my ICB integration team and start having a conversation around what the hell is place and what is our responsibility and what are we doing and how do I connect all the people and going, I don't know how we do this, but together, I think that was that's the fundamental piece. And I think at least two or three of our place leads just did not have the confidence or the connectivity to connect at that level, being perfectly frank with you. I think the other thing is about a common purpose. You know, what are we trying to do here together? Um, I came in to draft a roadmap and I start, as I started drafting that roadmap, it was really clear that some of our ICS partners had a cl really clear idea of what that common purpose should be and what they wanted it to be for their organisations or their constituencies. But what's fundamental is that we get the right people around the collaborative table together and we develop a shared common purpose. It's not just about what the VCSE want or what the ICB want, it's about actually Where's the VCSE best place to contribute to our emerging shared strategy? Thanks, Rachel. So um, a roadmap for the VCSE Assembly was published in July and was taken for consideration of the Assembly Board at the end of July and approved. Next one, Rachel. I think 
um, I want to be really clear. The roadmap, and this is a published document, which is sitting with the ICB EMT for decision at the moment. It does it does set out the actions and resources required for the next steps. What it doesn't do is all the really, really exciting stuff that I think we could be doing at place once we're really clear what our shared agenda is going to be at place. And of course, how we're going to fund that as well. That has to be also has to be really clear. Next one. Thank you, Rachel. So the main change um, in the proposals that we've got and in the um, structural re um, request that's gone to the ICB leadership team is for that second tier of operational management. So we have a board, um, which is the strategic alignment piece, so the VCSE assembly board and their function and lead. We also have place leads and we've redefined that place lead job description and person specification. Um, and we're looking to uh, re-recruit against that. But what we then have is what I'm calling an operational management team. And that is not just the team of the, the place leaders coming together. It's fundamentally made up of our health inequalities lead. We've got a commissioning lead in there. We've got an ICB comms and engagement officer in there. And I think I've only just started. I think that operations team grows ICS wide as we get the right players around the table to really engage our sector in the right parts of what we're trying to do. Next one. Thanks, Rachel. I just wanted to drop that one in. The roadmap has 12 clear objectives and I've been quite quite clear about them. The, yet the blue stuff is what I call nuts and bolts stuff. It's let's get these job descriptions right. Let's learn from our pilot period. Let's recruit the right people into the right places. Um, and let's be really clear about our modus operandi. And also, of course, working through the restructuring of the ICB, how the assembly sits alongside the ICB and, and, the, and the relevant officers that are required. The green stuff is the exciting stuff. That's the stuff that you know, we want to really start working on together. Um, and, and there are some really good anecdotal examples. Um, the Interact project in Norwich is one that's been fairly well lauded. But for, for that, there's probably two or three others across each place that we're starting to work on. But the point is, we don't want this to be anecdotal. We want it to be systemic. And the last slide, thank you, Rachel. Um, oh no, two more. This is just a summary of what will be different. Um, I'll, we'll circulate these, Aliona, with the minute, so I won't read through these, but it's just a real you know, headline summary of the six things that are gonna be different. I will just pull out the fundamental one being that the ICB directly has a direct communication channel both to and from the VCSE sector. Uh, so the last slide, thank you, Rachel. I just wanted to put this one up. Um, as, as coming into the ICB, I'm working with the logic model um, format that we have in the ICB, the theory of change, and, and I wanted to share the hypothesis. And I'm just going to read this one out. And bear in mind, you know, this 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 logic model is just being iterated. So what I find is every time you engage a partner or pick it up yourself, you want to fiddle with it. But the idea is that improved partnering with the VCSE sector across Norfolk and Waveney will lead to an increase in early and preventative interventions, building community resilience. An increase in community resilience will help people of Norfolk and Waveney to live longer, healthier and happier lives. It will also reduce the need for more expensive, more acute health and social care needs across the system. So I'll leave that one with you as as our direction of travel for the VCSE assembly. I hope that's OK, Alia. Thanks so much, Daniel. Uh, it is indeed. And yes, Rachel will upload to admin control and uh, of course will be on a website. So there are some spelling errors before we put on a website. Just correct them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, nothing drastic. OK, we have hands up. Alex, you and then and then uh, Paula, please, followed by Tracy. Thanks very much. I, I like the concept of the, the, the voluntary sector partnership, but it's been going now for, I think, nearly four years. And I've still yet I don't understand what outcomes have happened as a result of it. And it strikes me that it, it seems to be a very expensive um well meaning and laudable um piece of work but but without any outcomes i kind of feel it just becomes another talking shop and from a public perspective what it concerns me is that we just have another layer of management that everything seems to be going through 
Thank you, Alex. Not sure who can take that. Um, Daniel, I'm sure you um, can provide um, some Matt. insight. But Mark, I'm just looking at you also. Mm -hmm. Can I respond first, yeah. Mark? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Alex, I, I, that criticism has been levelled at me by sector colleagues, and, I, and I'm not going to be overly defensive of it, other than to say it's not been up and running for four years. You know, the model actually has been up and running for um, just over a year with place leads in place. And uh, those place leads have been um, working to try and interpret that shared agenda at place and to build a working partnership. That hasn't always worked. Um, well, sorry, can I just interject there? Yeah. Because actually the, the, the organisation has been being funded for nearly four years now. So whilst it might not have been up and running, you know, public funds have been uh, uh, sort of attributed to it. And that, that's where my concern lies. Alex, can I clarify? You, you, you're talking about the assembly itself, yeah? Yeah. 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 And, and, okay, and, so we're know, talking about, yeah. Can I come in there just quickly, yeah. please, Alina? Please, so I know yeah. I'm across the time. No, I think it's a fair challenge, challenge, Alex, but I think this, we are different now. We're an integrated care board now, which is different to being a CCG. And I think our ambition is high. Uh, and rightly so. Uh, and uh, so I think, you know, let, let's challenge us. We had uh, quite a long session at uh, exec management team this morning. Actually, Daniel was there, Frankie was there and, and uh, Andrew, who's just joined to think about how do we really push this agenda forward? You know, I think almost without exception, there is support to really push this agenda forward. What you've highlighted is how do we how do we turn that into something that delivers an ultimate benefit for patients and communities. Uh, and uh, as your last slide alluded to, Daniel. So I think that was the challenge that we've put put to, to Emma and Daniel in the most recent guys within the ICB is we're keen to progress now, um, accepting that kind of challenge and right, so it's right we challenge ourselves. Um, so I think that that's our ambition to, to really, really push on from this point. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Paula. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I do ha I'm going to share some sympathies with Alex uh, speaking on behalf of health and wellbeing partnerships. Um, I, I, I'm struggling a little bit to understand uh, the value of the VCSC place assembly. And if I just put my Great Yarmouth hat on, it, it hasn't worked in the Great Yarmouth and Waveney place area. Um, the eight health and wellbeing partnerships are all at slightly different places in their in their formation and uh, maturity, but they all have the VCSE sector within neighbourhoods and place around the table already. So my my pushback is this, I have two two pushbacks. One of them is can we be really clear when it's an ICB resource and when it's an ICS resource? because we already have VCSEs in our health and wellbeing partnerships as part of the ICS. And my second one is, where does that leave the district, borough and city councils who are running health and wellbeing partnerships, who know their communities and know which are the trusted VCSEs within the place? At district, borough, city council level, and of course at county level, it's public taxpayers money that's spending it on our officer resource. And whilst health is not a, is a non statutory function for us, we're all very keen to work within the ICS and coordinate work with our VCSEs that we know really, really well. So I do feel there's quite a lot of duplication here. That, that would be my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Tracy, before I go to you, would you mind if I come in here because it connects completely, so I don't want to go backwards and forwards. But uh, Paula, in regards to district councils knowing the patch, so to speak, and knowing the, the providers, uh, I will challenge you on that because not everyone does. There are providers who are doing quite a, quite a bit of work and the councils are completely disengaged to them. I mean, VCAC providers. So it's not quite true across the patch. For me, is the engagement and again conflict of interest. But uh, I work in the VCAC sector, and um, and I do not see the engagement in the sector. And Daniel, uh, contra question to you would be in terms of the roadmap: How did you engage the sector as a wide sector to produce that roadmap and to produce the thinking? I know the board, the VCAC assembly board, was engaged, but how did you engage with the rest? Because the board is not the sector. And yes, we may have twelve thousand overall different VCAC community groups and all that. 
however, not everyone is interested in this area of work and, and healthcare. So um, I am just concerned about the level of engagement and um, and how that actually contributes to the development of the thinking and the working of it. And yes, I agree with Paula and um, Paula, who was before you? Sorry, I forgot now. The the places, sorry, the places really did not engage the providers. So there was a, there wasn't an effective the, the place leads and the providers. I do not believe that that worked. So there is lots of improvement to take place. Sorry, Tracy, I'll come to you now. But no, no, that that's okay. I mean, taken on the board to everybody's comments. I mean, certainly from my, the place where I chair in Norwich, it has worked well. So I think we've got. As Daniel had already said, we've got that variation. So that those kind of place relationships in Norwich, certainly Daniel has been the, the place board lead and we've had good links with the partnership. So we'd managed to do some linking up. So I think there's something about understanding kind of the strategic direction. But I do think where that contact with the population of the communities, it really does work at place. And it really works when you've got those good relationships and collaborations. I know that certainly from the, the Norwich locality um, integration and partnerships, head that Daniel absolutely made sure that he had regular kind of one-to-ones to support that and certainly the wider sector so I think it's getting the roadmap kind of you know right strategically but also thinking what works well where and how we can share that practice I, I guess across the system I think that would be kind of my reflections where it does work well somewhere at a place level. Okay you, quite, quite yeah. a lot in that. Firstly, Tracy, just thanks very much for that little endorsement of some good stuff happening in Norwich. Um, I I feel we've got a huge distance to travel in Norwich and we've really only started and scratched the surface. So I just want to respond to, to a few of those um, issues that have been raised uh, around the, you know, how would the sector consulted on the assembly roadmap? Um, quite a limited time, but we did have a um, fairly well attended, um, probably about 30, 40 attendees at a, 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 structure, a, a strategic review session that we held uh, at the end of ju June, which we asked BCSE organisations to feed into. We used Menti polls and we, um, we proposed some um, assembly agenda items for, for working in partnership and tested those out as we went forward. Um, really, the the rest of it was around qualitative. It was around what wasn't working. So it was the exit interviews with those um, place leads um, who didn't work and also with their ICB and ICS colleagues um, where it didn't work. And I think we do feel that we can we can do a better job in that space. Um, I want to also come back on the value of this at place level and you know who who which bodies think they're best placed to be able to know their community. Um, I've been involved in the sector since the early 1990s, and I've gone through about. Daniel, you are frozen. Or oh, your screen is and we can't hear you. What a time to freeze. Ah, talk about luck. Daniel, do you want to try and move your mouse or something to unfreeze yourself? I don't know what one does in this situation. But whilst Daniel is trying to regroup with us, um, I, I think just my my reflection, the voluntary sector definitely has a place and a role to play and taking the agenda forward. Uh, lots of preventative and early intervention work can be undertaken by um, the sector. Uh, the joint forward plan Cla cla you know, clarifies for us that prevention early intervention definitely should be as a golden thread through everything we do. Um, so there's no doubt that the sector should be playing a key role in it. We just need to make sure that we sort out the way it works, all the inter <laughs> interlinks with what Paula was talking, we need to make sure there is no duplication. But also for me is making sure that we're actually inclusive of the sector uh, that is not just the same people are us because they are the ones who respond or because that's the people who are known. So we just need to make sure that we are opening opportunities to the sector overall. If the sector doesn't want to engage or individuals, organizations, that's fine. That is their choice. But let's not restrict their engagement just because we do not approach them or give them the opportunities. So uh, I don't know if Daniel will be able to rejoin or not. But Mark, can I leave the message with you for Daniel, please, that we just need to clarify things and make it, make it work. Uh, but of course, we need to have some resource allocated to it to make it work too, without duplications and without running around and not knowing what's 
happening and where. So um, it is lots of work to be done, but I'm sure it's positive. We're moving forwards. Frankie, uh, you put your hand up. Yeah, it was just to um, to point out that on the agenda, this is for discussion and noting. So it's yeah. not for approval or... No, so it, not you know, exactly. We, yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. There's plenty of work to be done. So we're here to seek feedback and now where we are at, and actually thank you so much to all of you who raised the issues because they're fundamental issues to to sort out for us to be able to take this forward properly okay thank you so we'll move on now and uh, thank you to daniel when he rejoins if he does uh paul very quick update please on the constant engagement Thank you, Aliona. Um, so people that have just joined the meeting uh, since I spoke earlier, I'm Paul Hume, we're Associate Director of Comms and Engagement at the ICB. So I'm not going to dwell too much on the lived experience representative involvement, um, other than to say that the packs, the draft recruitment packs, are um, have been issued with the papers. They are more or less nearly final now. If anybody does have any further comment on that pack and the easy read, please do get in contact with me direct and I'd be happy to finalise um, any comments into those. Conscious that there's two more items after me on the agenda and I think well, I want to give Andrew and Co and, and Karen a lot of time for those. Um, so I'm just basically going to say one final thing and that is the next face-to-face -face meeting of the Com North Cumberland Comms and Engagement Group is taking place on the 11th of October. It's going to take place in Norwich, and one of the items on there um, we will be focusing on is the terms of reference for our group. Now, it's the group's been in existence now for probably about a year and a half. We've had lots of meetings um, across the system in relation to comms and engagement and aligning efforts, reducing duplication. But one of the key things that we're really keen to do now is make sure that now we've got the Patients and Communities Committee up and running, and it's been up and running for some time, is make sure that this committee gets the assurance it needs and the reporting mechanism it needs to be able to actually understand what the comms and engagement group is doing, what it's focusing on, which are the big ticket items that we're looking at as a system. So we're going to re review the terms of reference again at the meeting on the 11th of October. Once those have been agreed by the comms and engagement leads on the group that represent um, the group in its totality, we will then bring those back to the committee for final review and endorsement, and then we'll formalise the reporting arrangements between the wider group and indeed the Patients and Communities Committee. So I'm happy to Thank take any questions on that. Thank you. We have uh, Alex and then Cathy. Sorry, I seem like the person of doom and gloom today. Apologies for that. Um, I would just like to throw out a slight caveat that we need to be very careful with that comms and engagement group, that there isn't an expectation that they will do the work of the ICB or the ICS that they are partnering organisations that will help where they can. But I think, uh, you know, it worries me that um, there could be an expectation that they will take up the mantle and run with everything. And so it's, I'm just throwing out a sort of bit of caution, basically. Just to reassure you, Alex, the actual group, it's more about making sure we come together as collectives so that each of us know roughly what everybody's doing at the same time and what plans we've got in place. One of the key things that we've seen since we became as an ICS last year is actually there's a lots and lots of activity that's going on, but actually some of it's not necessarily well timed. Some of it's there's got quite a bit of duplication. So it's about actually for some of the big things that are going on in the system where we know, for example, our ah, health watch is about to go and do this. But actually QEH were thinking of doing something similar. Actually, let's try and group some of these things together to try and reduce the duplication that's going on and then make sure we've got a very well oiled mechanism to be able to actually make sure that we are working together as a system and trying to actually, you know, generate the same key messages, help each other Oops. out. I'm, I'm very sorry, but we can't all generate the same key messages. Health Watch is an independent organisation set up by statute, which will sometimes be very controversial in its response and actually be holding the ICB to account, which actually is completely counterintuitive to what you've just stated. No, but what I'm talking about, Alex, is more the key kind of 
comms and marketing campaigns that we've got, there's lots of things that go on across the system. Whereas actually, if we make sure that we've got a bit of an awareness as who's doing what at each moment in time, we can make sure that actually we're much more aligned. But I completely get the you know the absolute relevance of the statement you've just made. Completely agree with that. Okay, thank just you. To Alex, just to add to that, I have meetings with um, NETS from various provider trusts, non-exec directors, uh, responsible for patient engagements and comms, and they're all saying, let's not duplicate, because sometimes it happens, we're asking the same patient the same question by two different providers. So uh, we're I talking about those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Kathy, was your hand up? Are you? Yeah, it was, but it was a similar, it was a okay. similar question. So. Lovely. Thank you, Cathy. Any other questions for Paul? No, Paul, no hands up and we'll look for the next update and the draft uh, tour when it was approved, is approved by that group. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Andrew Palmer, we're going to move on now to Andrew, who is going to take us through initially to start with transformation board update and then community services review update. So, Andrew, I'm sure you're there somewhere. I can't see you yet. But, yeah, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> I'm here, Chair, thank you. Welcome. If you can introduce yourself and then take us through the first of two items, please, Andrew. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for your time this afternoon. For those that I've not met, I'm Director of Performance Transformation and Strategy and Deputy CEO. That's a very long job title. Uh, I, I do everything that my other colleagues don't do, okay. um, part of which is to try to coordinate all of our transformation. So you've got a couple of updates with you today. I'll take transformation first. I'm not going to go through the paper, but I did want to pick just a few points up for um, context. So the aim really is to provide assurance to this committee and also today to get approval to the current terms of reference. We've had to make a couple of changes there. And it's, of course, our first report to the committee. So in this paper, we've set out some of the key areas of focus and we take the lead through the Transformation Board on convening all of the partners in the system and I'm pleased to say VCSC are part of that as well also with the district council district councils too sorry the county councils so we, we've got a really broad spectrum so we cover integrated care strategy in terms of how we can support the work on that the JFP joint forward plan that you've seen here before work around cost improvement programs the community services review that will come on to shortly as well as some of the more technical aspects of moving services from NHS England over to the ICB for commissioning. So quite an eclectic and wide ranging group with a, a similar, I guess, agenda to fit. So it's probably one of our longest standing groups in the system. It's been maybe four years or so since its inception. And I think it's been quite a useful forum for bringing those things together. It is developed with system partners. So it's definitely not seen as a ICB group. It, it truly, and I hope it is as the chair, truly, convened to be a system wide group and it's there to bring the partners together to really try and tackle and debate and agree and move forward those tricky strategic issues that affect all of us. We've got some sub boards that report through to the group and they come through our program coordination group. So there's a tight link there between some of the program boards across the system. So those covering topics such as elective recovery, for example, mental health and so forth. And really, I've set out here in the paper what we've been doing over the last 12 months, particularly with our ICB hat on. So I won't go through the key areas of focus. We can pick that up in discussion. But just before I stop to discuss and take any questions, just a note on risks in the committee. So at the moment, the Transformation Board does not hold any risks itself. So we make sure that the relevant programme boards or the relevant projects hold them within their own governance. But I think that is going to change when we start to see the transition of specialised services. So I would expect that to happen. For those of you that are board members, you'll know from last week as part of the approval of that paper that we'll be bringing back a comprehensive assessment of risk for the transfer of specialised services in November. And right at the very end, I've set out the focus for the year ahead. So lots of work around supporting the inequality strategy. We're not leading it, but we can, I hope, support that work. Lots to do on the joint forward plan and strategic alignment across the board, actually, and also some pretty significant work on efficiencies and productivity. Also, the community services review that we'll come on to in a moment. <laughs> now, we also provide some support too around the coordination of the clinical strategy and moving that forward too. 
as you'll be familiar with from other reports. And then really just that whole piece around evaluation and just making sure that as a group of pretty senior system partners, we're focused on the right areas. So, so that's the role of the transformation boards. Um, very happy to take any comments or questions and discuss. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andrew. And of course, the terms of reference were uh, circulated too. So we are familiar with who's sitting on a board and all the governments around. So thank you so much for so supplying that. Frankie, you have a question um, for Andrew. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, thank you. And and Andrew, apologies, I've I've picked this up with Liz in terms of the forward plan of the transformation board. But essentially, the the transformation board, to paraphrase you, is about implementing our strategies and you know, implementing them and tying them together to make sure we really are doing what we we said we'd do in the clinical strategy and the joint forward plan and so on and so forth but but um health inequalities has snuck in there and i think it was a hangover from before we had set up the health inequalities and phm oversight groups and the board which actually um feed directly and i don't think it they need to be coming to that group as well i think we're in danger of duplicating and i'm and I'm pretty sure Liz has already taken it off the forward planner for you, but I think my timing of that comment is probably, I probably missed the paper deadline for that one. So I just wanted to highlight that we don't need to bring everything everywhere all of the time. <laughs> so health inequalities, in fact, Tracy, who's with us today, chairs the Health Inequalities Oversight Group. She's responsible for developing that strategy, which leads into the Population Health and Health Inequalities Board, which actually provides assurance directly. So I just wanted to make that point because otherwise we're just going to tie tie ourselves in knots I think yeah welcome that and very happy to take one off the list but I, I guess Tracy yeah. the <laughs> offer remains to you that if you're looking for a space with pretty senior system partners to talk about how your work aligns with everything else that we're doing then you can come and have that conversation with us and as chair very happy to support that so we'll add value where you need it and very happy thank you not to duplicate I'm with you on that one thank you thank you Thank you, Frankie. I, I think what will help really is to get the current organogram of the governance and all the boards because there have been additions, changes and so on. Uh, and as a committee, I think it will be good for us to uh, know where things are sitting now. Thank you. Uh, Karen? Hi there. Um, I'm Karen Bryant, Associate Director, Local Commissioning for the ICB. Um, I just I think it's really great this board in terms of bringing the potential silos together and having that in one place and that kind of cross sector um, discussion. Um, I just think, Andrew, I think there would be benefit in sort of promoting the work of the board throughout the ICB a bit more because I think it is a really, you know, it's great. This is where it all comes together. So just sort of a plea to sort of spread the word a bit within the ICB, I think would be great. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Andrew, quick question from me. And future work plan, the joint forward plan, refresh and monitor and monitoring, yeah? Um, yeah, completely the right thing to do. Is there an implementation plan which supports the joint forward plan, please? Yes. So, so what we did when we convened the, the eight ambitions and the objectives is we were quite, how can I put this? We were quite careful to ensure that they were measurable because the, immediately the next step with any strategy when you come to measure it and, and frankly we've had some challenges with the clinical strategy in that regard is, is how do you turn it into something that's measurable so there is and we've begun the work on that we'll be doing that and I think that would be subject to your approval chair we'd fit that in in probably Q4 of this financial year we'll come back and report an assessment of our progress against those to the committee if that would be useful yes please so is that sort of January time do you think that is Probably, yeah, Jan yes, towards the towards the end of the year. I and mean, if I could maybe just be a bit flexible over that, but definitely within this financial year's business, we'll come back with a a kind of 12 months on review of where we've got to. We'll be doing it anyway for the board, so it'd be helpful to get committee's view here. And actually, we might want to just reflect on whether they're still the right objectives as part of that annual refresh as well. There could be some new things that we need to take in scope and maybe some things now that we could take out. So, yeah, very appreciate of that support. Thank you, Andrew. And of course, it's important for us to remember that in all the reviews, we need to take into account the feedback we get from our residents. <laughs> so it, we will need to make sure that we um, sort of build into our conversation the feedback. And there's projects which are working on that, uh, including, you know, the Health Watch, including Community Voices and many others. So we just need to tie up all those things. Uh, but the refresher does need to have the feedback from our residents on the plan. Thanks so much, Andrew. Uh, Kathy. 
that was that was going to be my question actually is it, the, the feedback that we have had from residents given i mean it it was tiny wasn't it the proportion of people who actually participated in the survey and in the workshops relative to the size of the population in in Norfolk and Waveney so how how do we you know how do you say okay that <laughs> that is representative of the feedback because you know all the other people could have said something completely different so how do you how do you triangulate all this stuff and make sure that we are listening to the feedback if you like which could be very different thank you Kathy so I'll have a go at answering that. So I think we're, we're straying into the community review paper on that one. So probably a good segue, Cathy, in a moment, just to jump across to that. But part of the, I think the work of the Transformation Board really at the moment is it's what we should have at the moment. But I think in the fullness of time, as we develop a bit more through the governance around place and empowerment there, but also our provider collaboratives, you'll see the role effectively the Transformation Board could no longer exist potentially and that everything will be kind of led through our, our, our new kind of more localized ways of doing things which which I think is the vision isn't it in the in the future so mm -hmm. transformation board is there for now what we try to do is by steering the community review we try to make use of the existing feedback from our communities where we can so we're quite kind of caught conscious not to create any huge new feedback mechanisms because it, it's very time consuming isn't it and as I was listening to earlier it can duplicate so you'll see our chair just straying into the CSR paper now. We've got the joint forward plan stuff that we've taken into account there, the community voices and so on. And yeah, you could have a conversation about statistical significance. So the workshops are put on, people are invited, they are available. I'm not representing that as any kind of statistically significant feedback, but what it does is it adds another dimension to what we already know and I think that's the way I like to look at it that if we take everything that we hear from people on everything you're starting to see some very common messages and I think the two slides three and four in the appendix those two big blue boxes I would hope that you recognize all of those things pretty much from any conversation you've ever had with anybody anywhere these are the things that matter most to people so the, the fact that we haven't been able to reach as many people with this doesn't mean we're not hearing the messages, I think. The, the other thing just to put on the radar as well on this, and Che, you might want to consider perhaps a future item on this, is the integrated care patient survey that's going to be mandated from 25-26. We're just exploring whether or not there's an opportunity for us to be involved in that early. Um, not committing to that just yet. It's hot off the press this morning, so not been able to flag that up yet. So there will be a, a national survey on the experience of people and their carers in how they experience integrated care. So I think that's going to be of the sort of order of the national patient survey in terms of scope. So I think, Cathy, at the moment, we're kind of trying to fill that gap at the moment. There'll be something more robust nationally in the future. But yeah, at the moment, we're trying to bring together all the feedback that we've got to shape shape that as far as we can. And, you know, and I hope that the committee recognises the messages contained in that paper in those mm in those two blue boxes. I certainly do. Andrew, okay. thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, ju just for, for clarity. So when I was asking about the joint forward plan and actually asking our residents if they see any difference from what we're doing, I was really referring to joint forward plan across all priorities, yeah? Kathy brought us nicely into, uh, in a way, linked it now to the community services. Uh, and you already uh, explained some stuff uh, about about it but would you mind if you just give the highlights because blue boxes could be in all sorts of presentations <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> but this if you just give fine. us the highlights now on the community services review update uh, so then we can finish with that one please andrew yes of course so uh, the, the community review is 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 broad and wide ranging and and hopefully you'll be aware of it from some of the communications that we've put out, but it's very important to note that the first stage really has been a listening exercise. So the whole work today has been to hear from staff, people that use our services and communities about what they think about their current experience. So when we move into the future phases around how might services be provided differently, we do that from a base of having listened quite carefully. And I remember, um, Alex, we met over at your HQ, didn't we, apart, uh, as part of the JFP work, just to try to understand the things that matter most to people. So we're taking what we can from every source. So the workshops were available in each of the place areas and place teams 
were invited to those, placed chairs were available, were invited to those, and they were reasonably well subscribed. And actually, we did learn some quite interesting things from it. And the key themes really, if you don't have the slides in front of you, are about care being more joined up. So something you would absolutely hear everywhere. Information sharing, so, that, so back to the telling your story once came across pretty strongly. Actually expecting us as providers and organisations to communicate and collaborate better with each other. So, you know, it's, it, it's a responsibility on us to sort ourselves out so that the people that use our services have a better experience. Talking about the right amount of capacity within the community, thinking about how we can make people's death the experience that they would choose. You know, how do we develop that kind of choice of place of death and actually that whole experience and actually having that conversation came across also quite strongly. Voluntary sector involvement came in and you know, how do we make sure that those people that are working closest often to patients and our communities actually are involved? And I caught the tail end of that conversation, some positive stuff, I think, there. And, and really the kind of final summary points were thinking about how might we move money and resources around? How might we support the development of places? So we have that much more localised service design. And this isn't just about kind of having places a label. This is about making it mean something. And, and I think, to be honest, we're still wrestling a bit with how we can bend NHS governance to support that, but we will find a way. And also really thinking about the best patient pathway. And, and I, I guess the overwhelming message I would hope most people recognise is about how we can help people stay at home as long as possible, how we can make sure that we design services around patients. So nothing particularly brand new, I would say, in here, some slightly different perspectives, but just good to see that that we've got a sort of consistent feedback across this and the joint forward plan. And many of you are much better placed than I to judge whether that's representative, but it seemed to be from from my perspective. So that, that's what we've heard. Happy to have a conversation if that's helpful. Mm. Andrew, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I'll have my reflection if I may. I'll support Cassie's concern in a way. I sat in some of those uh, engagement events. Uh, lots of representatives, professionals in the meetings rather than residents. Uh, so I'm not sure how representative that was. Uh, and I'm not saying that uh, professionals don't have a view. Of course, they will have the views they get from the uh, service users and so on. But nonetheless, in terms of the actual engagement with the wider resident you know, population, I am not sure that was as telling as or the information we got is as telling as it could have been. So, uh, yes, if we can have some sort of reality checks at some point, uh, to make sure that we are still up to date with what our local residents think it will be good. Uh, I'll leave you to think about that. But uh, it was a very good starting point. Definitely uh, good to get that going. And I think we just have to build up on that. Yeah. But um, it, lots is going on in that area too, in terms of community services uh, review. So, uh, and can you give us a little bit of uh, sort of synopsis where we're going from here now with it? When are the decision making processes going to take place and things like that? Yeah, so the, the next stage is having consolidated what we've heard, but also had some further conversations with the partners is to set up, set up a, uh, a project board, I think you'd probably call it. So we've got representation from the partners and other people if we need to do that as broadly as we can really whilst making it manageable to, to make it not an ICB based project now this has been the beginning of it so this will then be to kind of manage the business of the design work going forward we've got already some interest from a number of partners about the areas that they would like to put in scope and some of their suggestions on how we could do things very differently and the way that we're going to approach that is to agree a set of prototypes where in each of the place areas, we try to find something that everyone's happy to get behind as a jointly agreed priority and use that to test out some of these ways of working. Because to, to think about how we might move workforce around, how we might flow funding differently around the system, how we might reduce the handoffs, all the practical stuff that tends to stop a good idea from actually happening. We're trying to find a method, Chair, about how we can address that with a view to then rolling that out more widely. So the prototype approach is what we're going to work on in the next probably four to six months or so. And then the aim would be that we'd have some feedback and we'd be ready to roll with some of those changes from 1st of April next year. Subject to the consultation outcome on the ICB structure, 
we've also got a, a slightly different focus within that structure and a number of teams that are facing towards places. So there'll be more capacity dedicated to support the partners in each place and help to bring them together and support them. And I caught the end of Paula's conversation there too. So for me, the success of this will be how do we kind of fit in and work alongside what's already there? And I guess my takeaway is that what might work in the East is not necessarily what might work in the West and so forth. And we've got to find a way to do it. Hence why we're looking at somewhere between three and five prototypes to give different places the chance to work differently. So that's the next step. Uh, at the end of that, basically, we'll have a, a list of services that we consider to be in scope and probably in which order we think we should tackle them. But the aim with this is to bring other strategies in play as well. So, for example, the acute hospitals clinical strategy identifies a range of services that they feel would be suitable for provision outside of acute trusts. So we'll be looking at whether this can support that. And, and it'll be there's going to be a multi year piece of work. So we would hope to have a much clearer view by the end of the financial year. Um, I'm happy to come back at some point between now and then with a bit more concrete detail as that develops. Appreciating it's a little bit vague at the moment, but that is a very early stage that we're at in the pro in the process at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Before I go to Frankie, my plea, please, uh, if we can make sure that we don't create postcode lottery. I understand about the place, but also we need to be mindful that certain needs of the population are across the whole of Norfolk and Waveney. <laughs> and uh, the second one is when you test the prototype, if we can have the residents, service users, sort of part of that testing, it'll be good. So let's test and trial before we actually get to the implementation uh, with the people who will be the recipients of what we're trying to implement. Thank you, Andrew. Frankie. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to sort of put my support behind. There's a statement in the in the cover sheet here, which I think is really important, and I really hope it doesn't get lost, which is the collective aim is to explore and agree the common outcomes that our whole population can expect yeah. wherever you live, well, I'm sure you can tell you, but th that's what this has to be about. That's so right. I think we're, we're getting a little bit caught up, I think, at, at times with a, this prototype or that prototype or who's involved. Actually, this is really about saying what every resident has a right to expect wherever you live. You know, you you, you should have access to this, whether you live in the north or the south, east or the west. And that's where I'd really like to get it to. Frankie, thank you. And that was a very good way of sort of summarizing this topic. We know that there is lots of work still to be done, Andrew. Yeah. It's a very good start and uh, is a very positive one. And thank you to you and everyone who has been involved in it. And uh, I, I do know there's all sorts of interesting parties involved in it. So well done for bringing everyone together. Um, the, yeah, it, it is a good way of moving forward. But as Frankie says, we must remember with what, what the bottom line is, yeah, and we need to make sure that the residents across the patch get um, what they expect, you know, what, what they uh, they would expect to find. So, uh, well done and thank you, Andrew. We will look forward to get an update uh, in due time when we have made some progress, if that's okay. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh, now, four minutes late. Any other business? No hands up and not real hands up either. So I think we're going to uh, stop there. I would like to thank you all for your contributions. I felt today's meeting was quite to the point and people were more open and happy to share things and their concerns. So please can we build up on that? That's what this is all about. So well done, everybody. Thank you. And please, please highlight. If you're not happy with things, just say it. Uh, and it will be good if you do have reflections about how the meetings are run. Please email me with them because there's always room for improvement for all of us. And especially me chairing these meetings. So I'll welcome your feedback. But thank you very much indeed. Look after yourselves and we'll see each other again in this capacity on the 27th of November. Until then, stay safe. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.